let's start the second lecture of the afternoon, which will be presented by Francesco Lin, and the title is Monopole Fleur Homology and Invariant Theta Characteristics. Please. Okay, well, thank you much, very much for the invitation. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, well, of course, it was a great honor and pleasure to be Tom's student. Uh, you know, you're always in, talking to Tom, you're always in for some good time, learning beautiful math, and being asked, as Andras was saying, like, very interesting questions uh, that, you know, it might take two hours, two weeks, uh, two months to, to solve. So this is, uh, this project is inspired by a question that Tom asked me about 10 years ago, I think. So, and I'm still, I, and I'm not solving, I'm not answering the question he asked me, but I'm trying to make some progress uh, along those lines. Um, yeah, so the, uh, I want to tell you about some uh, relation between, um, Monopole homology, so this is you know, some uh, topological invariants. Um, a three manifold uh, uh, defined uh, uh, from the cyber witten equations. Um, yeah, and this was defined by uh, Kornheimer and Rocca. Okay, and some very classical uh, topic of study in uh, the geometry of Riemann surfaces. So this is a uh, classical uh, geometry of algebraic curves. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I guess uh, Josh told us about a theorem from uh, 1897, I'll start from a theorem of, from, uh, of Jacobi from uh, 1850. <laughs> uh, I actually, uh, so it, it, it uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I, uh, I'm not actually sure his theorem. I, I, look, I try to look up uh, where this was first proved. But, yeah. uh, you know, either him or Plucker, but this is what Hitchin says, so I guess I'll, I'll follow him. So if you have, um, a uh, surface in P2, uh, which is a quartic, a smooth quartic. Okay, so the smooth set of a, you know, the generic uh, degree four polynomial, look at the set. So this is a, this is genus three. Okay, so yeah, so you know, you have this thing. And uh, a line, because the quartic surface will intersect it at four points. Uh, so you can ask yourself for, you know, lines that are tangent at two points. And that's what is called a bitangent. Okay, so it's a line by tangent. Okay, so the four is with multiplicity, so it makes sense to ask for two points of intersection. And the theorem of Jacobi is that in this setup, uh, there are exactly uh, 28 bitangents. Okay, so this is a very classical theorem uh, from 1980. Uh, yeah, so how is this related to what we're interested in? Yeah, so I, do, I don't know how they proved it exactly back in the days, uh, but in the modern, in, in, the modern uh, in the modern language, okay, so this thing is a Riemann surface of genus three. Uh, no, if you pick uh, any Riemann surface, Okay, you have K, the canonical bundle. Okay, and uh, yeah, um, the key object uh, we will look at, so key, uh, so I guess maybe you say definition. So this is a holomorphic line bundle. Uh, okay, so we can look at uh, line bundles which are square root of it, so, uh, so L holomorphic line bundle. So called uh, uh, is a theta characteristic. If uh, 
uh, it's, it's square, which is a, another holomorphic line bundle, is isomorphic as a, a, a holomorphic line bundle to the canonical. Okay, so yeah, so uh, le let me remark. So the canonical bundle has degree 2g minus 2, so this has degree g minus 1. So, and as a remark, uh, yeah, so on a, on a, on a surface, uh, if uh, sigma has genus g, there are exactly uh, 2 to the 2g um, theta characteristics. Okay, uh, yeah, so the, we have these, all these holomorphic line bundles, a lot of them, so in particular on the surface of uh, uh, genus three, we have two to the six. Um, and the theorem, so Jacobi, the theorem, theorem follows from the fact um, that uh, on a, uh, if, if you have a genus of sigma equals three, you know, there's uh, uh, then, so you know, we have this holomorphic line bundle, so we, get, we can look at the space of uh, holomorphic sections. So uh, H zero, so we look at the, uh, the, this is space of holomorphic section. Uh, and then the dimension of these is uh, one, or is either zero or one. And it's one for exactly uh, 28 uh, theta characters. Uh, theta characters. Okay, so somehow having holomorphic section of the square root of the canonical corresponds to this bitangent. Okay, so I, I won't go into more into that. I guess the, the key point is that uh, smooth quartic is embedded using its canonical linear system. So, you know, if, you, if you write things about that, you know, at the end of the day, it turns out that this theorem very uh, geometric and, and uh, uh, you know, very pretty follows from the computation of uh, the space of holomorphic sections of certain line bundle on your Riemann surface. Um, okay, uh, any question? Yes, so why is this related to uh, yeah, pleuromology or gauge theory at all, you might ask? Well, this is a, a, a maybe let me, here, this is a, a, a very beautiful observation due to Atiyah, which I actually learned from Tom's Riemann surface class, uh, uh, that, uh, so this is uh, by um, that this is really, you know, uh, so this computation here, which, you know, it's something about holomorphic sections and uh, complicated object in complex geometry, it's really a theorem in topology. So, okay, let me call this star, uh, star. Yeah, so it, it, that looks like a theorem in complex analysis because it's about space of holomorphic section. Let me tell you why it, it's a theorem in topology. Well, I guess depending on what you call topology exactly, but it's something I would call topology. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, theta characteristics on L, on sigma, you know, they're, they're somehow taking the square root of the canonical. So you might expect that it's somehow related to spin structures. And in fact, you know, the number two to the g is also the number of spin structure on your surface. So uh, indeed, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence uh, with uh, spin structures. Okay, and then here uh, we can go down and, uh, you know, uh, let's say you go to a natural number, which is, you know, L maps to the dimension on its zero L. Uh, instead of just looking at this number, you know, this number in principle, uh, depends on the Riemann surface you choose in general. So if you deform the complex structure, 
this holomorphic bundle moves around and the space of holomorphic section changes. But yeah, the key, uh, a very uh, nice thing is that if you reduce mod two, go to Z2, and this is a topological invariant, and in fact, you know, spin structures on a surface have a topological invariant, which is the arc invariant. Okay, so this is arc. Okay, sigma. Yes? Those two. Uh, oh, yeah, arc invariant. Uh, you know, this is the spin board this class. Uh, you know, it's in omega uh, two spin. Uh, sorry, omega spin two. Uh, which is Z2. Okay, and well, the claim is that this diagram commutes. So if you take a theta characteristic and take the arc invariant of the corresponding spin structure, that gives you uh, the dimension of the space of holomorphic section mod two. Okay, and I guess the, you know how this does it relate to gauge theory. Well, uh, so uh, so the idea this is uses that you know the del bar operator, which is you know the operator whose kernel is a holomorphic section. On a spin surface, this corresponds to the Dirac operator. Okay, and under this correspondence, uh, you know, to, to tie up with the, what I talked about last week, you know, uh, H0 of L um, can be made to correspond to, uh, uh, you know, it's in by, it corresponds to harmonic spinners. Okay. So, okay, so, uh, yeah, and this, um, this theorem here is somehow a manifestation of index theory of the Z2 version of index theory. Okay, so maybe let me remark even more clearly that, you know, uh, the dimension of H0 of L is not a uh, deformation invariant. Okay, but it's, it's mod two class, you know, it's a residue mod two, it's parity is, is the formation invariant. Okay, so in, in general, if you have a family of Riemann surface with a spin structure, then the space of harmonic spinner jumps, uh, but yeah, the, the mod two, uh, it will not. Okay, um, any question about this? Uh, yeah, so the question is like, why does this imply? So you can show that for a, for a surface of, yeah, one thing I didn't say is that if you have genus three, then the, the space of section can, can be at most one dimensional. So it, the parity that determines exactly what, uh, uh, which, which is either zero or one, yeah. I guess maybe there's, and you know, you can, I guess maybe the other thing is that the number of spin structure, sorry, um, and non hyper elliptic, which is, you know, you, you, you need to use the smoothness assumption at some point. But, um, yeah, uh, I guess on a surface, there's exactly a 28 spin C structure with odd arc invariant. I guess that's the, maybe the ingredients you're missing. Ah, okay, so I guess more, more on this side. Okay, I will talk about this later, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a long story, made very short, yeah. But yeah, I guess, yeah. So if you have a non, if you have a uh, non hyperliptic genus three surface, then this, this has to be it. It's either, it has at most one, and then the parity uh, determines whether it's zero or one. So you can compute, uh, the theorem follows from a topological considerations. Okay. Um, yeah, so again, okay, this is all about surfaces, and uh, uh, and there are, Holomorphic geometry. Yeah, so for today, I want to look at a, at a very specific example. So, uh, so you know, monopore cohomology is an is a invariant of three manifolds. I have to, uh, you know, construct three manifolds in some way. So I, I'll look at, I work in a very simple setup. So consider, uh, so this is a Riemann surface, and you consider an automorphism. Okay, so here I'll be looking at a genus, uh, you know, uh, Let's say, you know, for simplicity, genus L is two and phi, you know, so this implies that uh, phi has finite order. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, yeah. So you know, if you have a manifold like this, you know, if you have something like this, you can uh, look at its mapping torus. So this is mapping torus. Okay. So I guess the goal for today is to understand how uh, the fluoromology of this mapping torus somehow relates to the geometry of these automorphisms. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I guess uh, yeah. I said that I don't have a complete answer. Uh, to, to Tom's question from 10 years ago, uh, but I, I look at a very, you know, for today, uh, the, the big assumption for today, in some sense, in some sense this action is, 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 is very complicated, meaning that uh, um, we'll assume that, you know, you have this action, so you can take the quotient um, uh, phi, you know, as a natural uh, complex structure, so this is, uh, we'll assume that it, you get the Riemann sphere. Okay, so you know I might forget to say it at some point today, but this is our working assumption today. Uh, so this implies, in particular, that this mapping torus is a manifold with uh, uh, B1 of M phi is one. Okay, so it's. Uh, Yeah, so what are some examples of this? Uh, well, oh, oh, for example, if you pick any Riemann surface, which is hyperelliptic, and do the hyperelliptic involution, this is an example of that. Okay, you know, picture of a hyperelliptic involution. Um, but yeah, in general, uh, so if you have, you know, the Riemann surface associated uh, to z to the d equals uh, pw, okay, this is not inside c2, uh, so the Riemann surface, this will be like the Riemann surface of, um, yeah, so this has a natural action by, you know, zeta, uh, D to the D, Z mod DZ acts on this by you know, W maps to for zeta primitive this root of unity. Okay, uh, yeah, so you know, I'm, I'm only studying mapping total of finite. Um, order automorphisms, which from the point of view of topology might not be that exciting, you know, they're like, uh, but yeah, I guess the, from the point of geometry, they turn out to be uh, very interesting. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, and uh, let me also comment that, you know, you can show that actually every example that satisfies like this, you know, is, is of this form. So it's z to the d equals a polynomial for some polynomial. So this is really all, all you can think about, you should think about. And you know, the, the action can be, uh, have very complicated ramifications and stuff. So you know, the combinatorics is pretty complicated. <clears throat> okay, uh, yeah, so what's the point? Well, the point is that, so in this situation, we, so in the case of a single Riemann surface, of a Riemann surface, we had this correspondence between uh, theta characteristics and spin structures. Uh, yeah, so in this situation, we also have an interesting correspondence. So. Uh, we have the correspondence between, so you know, the, um, if you have a, uh, so you know, phi uh, acts on the set of theta characteristics. Um, okay, so it acts by pullback, or you know, uh, so uh, yeah, so it, uh, and you can look at uh, the fixed points of this action. Uh, yeah, so we have that, uh, so in our setup we have that the set uh, uh, of invariant uh, theta characteristic in one-to-one -one correspondence uh, yeah, with uh, spin C structures S on the mapping torus 
So not all of them, but the ones that are conjugate to, the isomorphic to they're conjugate. Okay, so this will call uh, self conjugate. Okay. And somehow you can also think of this uh, the spin C structure coming from spin structures. And this correspondence also uses B1 uh, uh, equal to one. Okay, so let me just, uh, for, uh, for clarity, let me uh, denote, you know, L. Yeah. Oh, sorry? Well, we're really getting spin C structure induced by spin structure. Uh, yeah. Well, the, you, 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 because B1 is uh, one, you get two spin structures who induce the same spin C structure. So the one to one correspondence is with spin C structures, which are isomorphic to its conjugate. Well, this is, you know, I'll take monopole phenomenology and, uh, well, the gauge group is bigger because B1 is positive, so you get Z components of the gauge group if that's the, the yeah. yeah. So, you know, you're not really, really losing any information, but, you know, this is the, the better way to phrase it for our purposes, yeah. Uh, I think. Yeah, so we have, uh, yeah, the action of, um, of uh, here. And then we have the action. Uh, uh, yeah, so suppose you have invariant, so L invariant. Um, so if I, let's say you suppose that you have a theta characteristic, which is phi invariant. Well, then you can lift the action of the automorphism to uh, the bundle. Uh, so phi lifts to action on the bundle, uh, and then you can lift it, you know, you can look at the action on the space of holomorphic sections. Okay, and the only thing to be careful is that, you know, we, we started with something of order D. Uh, let's say it has order D. And the action, the lift of the action might have double the order. So that's, that's something, you know, Okay, depending on which, you know, there, there, there might be some lift. Sometimes you might. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, uh, yeah, and yeah, and sometimes you, you, you have to have order 2D. Yeah. So. Oh, sorry, the question is like the, the lift is unique up to plus or minus 1, and the answer is yes. Exactly. Uh, okay, so we have this, uh, you know, uh, so before we look at the space of holomorphic sections, and somehow it's related to topology. Um, yeah, so here we have this other new space of holomorphic section together with an action on it. Okay, and it's a finite order action, so you know, it's a diagonalizable uh, action. So you, you ha we have uh, nice eigenvalues and uh, stuff. Okay, so let me tell you the, the, the main theorem, which are state in a very vague way, but then I'll tell you some comp examples of computations and uh, things you can do with it. So, I guess, the theorem, Uh, the Fleur homology groups uh, of um, this uh, pair, so M phi, with this spin C structure, which is coming from one of these uh, invariant theta characteristics, is completely determined. Uh, by uh, the spectrum, the, the eigenvalues of phi star. Okay, and there, you know, if you tell me the spectrum, there's a recipe that uh, produces you the Fleur homology groups. It's a little complicated, so I won't write it out, but there's an explicit formula. Okay, so, uh, there's uh, explicit explicitly determined. Okay, uh, yeah, so. Well, that's in the case of a non hyperelliptic genus 3 curve. In general, it can be arbitrarily large, yeah. 
Yeah, in general, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you another example so in which this thing is, is arbitrarily complicated. Yeah. Um, yeah, any question? Yeah. What are you? Yes, the question is that all of the groups. So really what I do is write down the chain complex. Uh, uh, yeah, and you can also twist coefficients uh, and do, yeah, I'll give you the, the Fleur chain complex uh, uh, without, you, you know, with a balanced perturbation, let's say. So you, you, know, you others can do it. Yeah. What, oh, sorry? Uh, yeah, the, the question is like, what about the grading? Uh, yeah, so in, in the, uh, so I can determine it, well, in the paper I worked out up to, uh, up to an overall shift. Uh, uh, the, 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 you know, it, it would be a the graded group up to an overall shift. And I think one can determine also the, the if one works a little harder, you can determine the, uh, the, the, the actual absolute grading of everything, yeah. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah, so let me tell you a, a, a basic uh, example. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, we had our example, the first example is hyperliptic involutions. Um, yeah, so the example one, so phi is hyperliptic involution. Okay, so one nice fact about the hyperliptic involution is that it leaves all spin structures uh, fixed. Okay, and what you can do, you can use the, the, the computation that you know, I'm not really telling you uh, to show the following. So you can show that, uh, uh, so, so all go through the 2G spin structures on sigma fixed. Uh, yeah, so and what you get is that um, uh, and phi as L for this, for the spin C structure correspond to one of these uh, spin structures. Uh, well, I'll, I'll draw a very schematic picture. So, you know, you have the, so it's a manifold with B1 positive, so you have two towers. So one tower will look like this, you know, and the other tower uh, uh, you know, ends up, you know, the, the action of, of the, the B1 action goes in this direction, and you know, the other tower ends a little lower. Okay, and, and that's it. And this quantity is, let me call, you know, how many, how much lower you go. And L. Okay, so there's no, you know, in general there would be some, this, this is the stuff in the image of the, uh, you know, HF infinity of HM bar. Uh, in general there's reduced bar, but in this case I'm saying that there's no reduced bar. And you know, here I'm doing the computation without twisting coefficients, but you can do uh, twisting coefficients. So, and what is an L? So an L, uh, yeah, so now I, I think the cool thing here is that now this is a theorem that relates uh, you know, topological invariance to objects in algebraic geometry that people have been studying for 150 years. So you, know, you can use computations in algebraic geometry to get computations in, uh, in fluoromology. So what you get here is that, you know, uh, so I guess it, it, this is an exercise uh, in uh, Albarello, Cornalba, Griffith Harris book uh, in Appendix B. Um, uh, implies that, um, so this NL is uh, zero for to the g plus one over g, uh, to g uh, theta characteristics. And then for every uh, w between one and g and w odd that exists exactly um, to g plus two, uh, g minus w theta characteristics 
uh, such that an L is W plus one over two. Okay, so this is the whole computation of the uh, self conjugate spin C structures on uh, or the fluoromology you know, for the mapping towards over the hyperliptic evolution. Okay, uh, any question? I'm not sure I know how to solve the exercise, but that's, that's, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, this, uh, yeah, it turns out that, uh, sorry, the question is like, is it dimension? Yeah, and uh, yeah, it turns out that in this case, this would be just the dimension of the space of linear systems, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, that, that might lead you to ask, oh, is it always this kind of boring example, which is the two towers? And the answer is no. So you can get actually arbitrarily complicated examples. Uh, so let me just, uh, so you can get examples. Uh, yeah. Uh, so how many torsion spin C structure which are not conjugate have? Uh, I think they're all, in that case, they should be all, I think, no, uh, yeah, uh, yes, they should be all, but, you know, I'm, I have to think about it a little more, but I think that they're all self-conjugating, that example there, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, so some other fun examples, uh, so this is example, example two, okay, so let me tell you, so can get, I can get, you know, this is a little boring because, you know, there's only these two towers, but you can get as ma a lot of reduced stuff if you want to. So, uh, so can get, um, you know, something that looks like this. So you have the two towers. Um, um, and then something that goes down a little bit, the other tower by let's say N. And then you might have something at the bottom that some reduced part at the bottom that goes up. And you can get this for n bigger equal than n. Uh, and this, you just need to look at order five uh, uh, automorphisms. Okay, it turns out if you look at order three, you still get just this boring thing without uh, extra reduced. If you look at order five, you start looking at, uh, you, you start getting extra interesting stuff, order uh, five uh, automorphism. Okay, uh, and in general, uh, yeah, um, in general, uh, um, yeah, um, any, any question about the statement? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the question is like, how hard would it be? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure, I guess. Uh, um, it might be doable. Uh, I don't know how. Uh, yes, they're supposed to have fiber, but they have D1 positive, right? So you need to be careful about uh, reduce the reducible of, uh, yeah, yeah, so um, you can use the cipher vibration. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, but you have the torus of reducibles, right? That you have to be careful how to perturb. So actually, yeah, uh, maybe I'll say a word later. Uh, really, the, the core of the theorem is a, is a yeah, the, the core of the theorem is a transversality um, result. So yeah, it's, uh, you, you, you should be able, yeah, the hard part of the theorem is being able to perturb the equation while keeping, understanding what's going on, but, um, uh, somehow being able to achieve transversality. So that's where I use the assumption that the quotient is P1. Otherwise, yeah, that, uh, that I don't know how to do. Yeah. Yes? Uh, yeah, the question is like, what about the non-spin structures? Yeah, uh, I think this, the method I can uh, talk about, I talk about can generalize to some other spin C structures, but in general, that, that they won't work for all spin C structures, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you don't, you don't use the uh, 
Yeah, I don't really use the cipher fabrication in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the computation, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I realized that after I wrote the paper, so, oh, this is cipher fiber, but yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so but you, you, you don't need, yeah. So, um, yeah, okay, and in general, you can, you can write, uh, you can write, uh, you can, so okay, so this is, uh, you know, okay, this is a useful computation if you know how to compute this action. Okay, and then, you know, there's a formula, very complicated formula that tells you this. Um, but yeah, of course, this is not an easy thing to do, right? You need to find out invariant spin, structure, spin structure and compute the space of, uh, the spectrum of the action of the automorphism on it. So it's, it's a pretty complicated thing. But you can actually do, you can compute, uh, um, um, for all automorphisms. of order p prime. Okay, in the case of non-prime, I don't know, you know, you might get stuck, but you know, I and I'll tell you a way to compute for p prime, or every case. Uh, and yeah, in particular, you know, one thing that in the case p prime, there exists unique uh, fixed uh, spin structure. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the question is like uh, how, you know, I have a recipe that from the action tells you the groups. So the question is like how do you compute the action? And yeah, so, so when P is prime, so in general, um, um, you can use um, the Atiyah bot uh, G-spin theorem. Okay, uh, to get info uh, about the action uh, phi H zero L in terms uh, of uh, fixed point locus data. Okay, so if you know everything about the fixed point locus, which is very easy to compute, for example, from the presentation z to the d equals pw, you just look at the local singularities of the polynomial, you can get info about here. And let me tell you, this is not, I'm not just using a tia bot here, but uh, because a tia bot gives you a formula up to science, which is not very useful in concrete places, but I use, luckily, uh, well, Danny and his collaborators work out the sign that exactly in the cases I needed. So this is uh, a rat plus rat. Ruberman. Uh, for signs. Okay, uh, yeah, so if you give me a polynomial, uh, uh, z to the d equals pw, uh, a curve, uh, from, from there you can compute some uh, partial, informa partial information about the traces of this action, for example. And then it happens that when the p is prime, that's all you need to compute the action. So when p prime, that uh, uh, determines uh, um, the whole spectrum. Okay. Yeah. And you know when p is not prime, you know there's things that you know don't don't, don't work. Perfectly, but you can still use this machinery uh, to, you know, you can reverse the machinery and use computations in topology to compute, for example, the dimensional spaces of holomorphic sections. Uh, yeah, so for example, we all know how to compute uh, the dimension of uh, zero surgery uh, on the figure on the torus knot. You know, that has a dimension we know how to compute, and that's a, you know, uh, the mapping torus of a finite order automorphism. And that gives you, you know, using the computation fluoromology, you get the dimension of the space of holomorphic structure for, for a holomorphic section for this bundle in, on this story, on this, on this mapping uh, of these uh, automorphics. Okay. Uh, let me just save the mark and reverse. Oh, 
technology computes for about yeah. for each zero there. Okay, so for example, the AG. surgery on PTQ. Okay? <clears throat> so that's the mapping torus on a surface of genus P minus one times Q minus one over two. Uh, um, okay, uh, yeah, so let me just comment a little briefly about the idea of this, uh, this computation. So the idea, I guess, is that you know, on surface times a circle, so you know th these manifolds are mapping to a finite order thing, so they always have a uh, finite cover with this surface times a circle. Uh, yeah. So th uh, for the trivial spin C structures, uh, uh, has uh, has no uh, the Cyber-Witten equations have no irreducible solution. Okay, uh, yeah, and this is uh, uh, very, um, uh, yeah, well-known fact. Uh, but yeah, you know, this doesn't allow you to compute the fluoromology because the equations are extremely degenerate. So uh, equations are extremely degenerate. Okay, in particular, you know, there's the, there's the torus uh, of flat, you know, of uh, U1 connections. On, on this manifold, uh, and the singularities uh, are a copy of the theta divisor. Uh, this is a singular locus. So the Hessian of the equations are extremely singular along this uh, theta divisor, which is a codimension three thing, and it's a extremely complicated and ugly. So this is very complicated. A good portion of this book is about studying how complicated the theta divisor is. So, uh, yeah, so I guess the, the point though is that, you know, uh, what you can do, uh, you know, so this is the, this is the hardest, you know, this is the simplest case in some sense because this is a mapping torus of the identity. But in some sense, it's the hardest because, you know, transversality is impossible here. Uh, yeah, and the idea is to look at the, like, more comp the most complicated case, which is the case of, uh, uh, so if, Fun. Then you know uh, the torus of flat. You know this has b1 and phi. Uh, this is um, one, and uh, you know the, so the, the this torus, the circle, and you know the singularities can be that bad. They're just points. And yeah, the the question is like, can you perturb? You know, the the hard part now is to figure out, you know, if you perturb properly, you know, you don't introduce irreducible solutions, and then figure out how the, the singularities, uh, uh, you know, uh, affect the homology and how they're related to the, 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 the space of holomorphic section of your curve. Uh, yeah, and that's, uh, that's, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about it, uh, so I'll end up here. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the question is, uh, yeah, in general, H0 val uh, depends on the space of the on This theorem, uh, uh, the theorem, because this is a topological invariant, this implies that the dimension of this is, uh, uh, doesn't depend on the complex structure. If you're, if you're deformed within phi invariant complex structures, yes. Uh, so the, so the, 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 so you can go perfectly from one way to the other, but not the other. So yeah, the eigenvalues, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, in principle it could depend, but I don't know, but it, it might not depend. Yeah, so yeah, I guess, yeah. Uh, 
okay. The, the question is like, can you do this for instantons? Uh, yeah, I don't know. The, this is a, it, it becomes a very linear theorem, so that's why you, it matches perfectly with uh, you know, uh, specific sections and linear algebra on them. Yeah, I'm not sure what happens in the instanton case. Yeah. But definitely hard, surely harder, but yeah, I don't know <laughs> how hard. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so the question is like, how do you prove this? Uh, yeah, so this, this theorem here, it's proved by essentially, it's some kind of dimensional reduction. You, you, so you, you show that there is somehow invariant under the circle and then boil them down to equations on the circle. And the question is there, so the, you, 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 an, you analyze the singularities of the Dirac operator, the family of Dirac operators, and you can show that somehow each eigenspaces will correspond to a point at a different angle in this circle. So you can somehow identify the singularities with the eigenspaces with, of that. And uh, yeah, and then it's about you know, uh, spectral flows. So the, uh, each dimensional eigenvalue gives you some shift between towers. And then, uh, so that allows you to write down actually explicitly the, the Fleur chain complex for this example. Uh, yeah, the question, can you see pin two homology? Yes, the, the, uh, the perturbation I use are pin two equivariants, so you can you compute pin two Fleur homology using the same uh, approach, yeah. Uh, the question is, can you interpret this on the theta characteristics on the orbifold? Uh, maybe, yeah, I've always been very confused by line bundles on orbifold, so I guess, uh, <laughs> but yeah, probably, yeah. 